Many are asking the same question. How do I deal with life pressures? There is no clear direction for my life. No matter what you are facing, no matter how difficult life may get, there is triumph over tragedy, hope out of your hopeless situation. No circumstance, however big or dark it seems, can stand against the miracles of God. Tune in and be encouraged as you discover the keys that unlock the doors to a life of freedom and joy. This is Life Beyond the Moment with Doug Stringer. Welcome to another Life Beyond the Moment with Doug Stringer. It's great to be with you again today. And I'm really excited about what I'm about to share with you. And the theme of my program today is Run Well, Finish Well. And of course, there's many, many scriptures dealing with running the race in such a way to, to obtain it, get your crown of glory and so on. But I want to start with a, a couple of stories. I was asked to be on the executive, executive committee uh, for a gathering, a national prayer gathering in Philadelphia. And I had, in the process of going back and forth to Philadelphia, meeting with the different pastors and ministry leaders and business leaders, I remember hearing a story by one retired Wall Street executive. And he said, growing up, uh, he never really had a great relationship with his parents. I mean, they loved him, he loved them, but just an awkward uh, relationship. And, and so when he got married and had children, he always wanted to be at almost every single athletic event that his children were involved in. And then his son was going to be seen by all these scouts. Uh, he was uh, graduating high school. He was part of a great crew rowing team. And all these college and uni university scouts were coming to watch them at this big regatta, a big event. And so his wife said to him, you know, you always go out there and you're always screaming and hollering. I wonder if it embarrasses our son. So he took his son aside and said, son, he goes, do I embarrass you when, when I come out there and I'm screaming? There's thousands of people screaming and I'm cheering for you. He goes, I'm just so proud of you. And he goes, I just want to be there for you. And I get so excited and I'm living my life and watching you and seeing the success of your life. And, and it makes me so happy as a father. And his son said to him, Dad, you don't get it, do you? He goes, of all those thousands of voices and all the people cheering their, their loved ones on or, or cheering for their favorite uh, crew member or their rower, I only hear your voice. Wow, can you imagine uh, when the son said this to the father, the father just got goosebumps and he said, wow, I'm so proud of you, son. See, the son and all the thousands of voices of people cheering, could only hear one voice. He heard the voice of his father. And that's a great story for all of us because there's so much noise pollution. There's so many things going on around us in the world. There's so many things that can distract us, discourage us, disappoint us, even disillus cause disillusionments in our life. But we need to learn to hear the voice of the father, our heavenly father. There are so many things that can cause you discouragement and in the midst of those times when there's cheers and noise and sounds, to learn to hear the voice of the Lord. And the voice of the Lord, the Heavenly Father, is always cheering us on, saying, you can do this. You can do this. See, in Christ Jesus, there's nothing impossible to us. All things are possible through Christ Jesus. He that lives in us is greater than he that's of the world. A spiritual father in my life, the late Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole, used to say, champions are not those who never fail, but those who who never quit. I want to look at a couple of scriptures here. Well, the first one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse uh, 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things, and now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Wow. In other words, all of us, we, we run this race in such a way that we exercise self-control. We're temperament in all, temperate in all things. We want to exercise self-control and bring this body and this mind in subjection to the Spirit of God that dwells in us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he says in verse 25, And everyone who competes again for the prize is temperament, temperate in all things. It means to exercise self-control in all things. Verse 26, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. 
you know, I have some friends that actually went to Tanzania to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And, you know, that's a great feat that people put in their bucket list to do in life. But to go climb a mountain like that, that's a great feat. And you can't just start and say, tomorrow I'm going to go climb that mountain. It takes a process of disciplining your mind, your body, exercise, preparation for altitude. There's a lot of things you have to get in preparation to be able to climb that mountain. Well, just like in our journey in life and running this race to obtain it, we need to learn how to subject our body to the Spirit of God in preparation, discipline, discipline this body, discipline our mind with the washing of God's Word to be able to accomplish the things that God's called us to do. There will come times that we may have struggles and challenges, even times that we scrape our knees and fall down, but, but we need to keep our focus on Jesus, the author, author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before Him was able to endure the sufferings of the cross and the shame. You see, we are champions in Christ. We can't do it alone, but the Bible says we can be champions for Christ, ambassadors for Christ, and we have to only learn to hear the voice of the Father if we're going to succeed, not the voice of this world. There was a um, time when I was used to be a wrestler and I was an, ath an athlete in, in the fitness business. And I remember when I was a wrestling champion in high school that I knew my opponent, I prepared, I exercised, I drilled to make sure I had muscle memory and I instinctively could respond to the, those that I was wrestling, to, wrestling with so I could win. And then when I became a Christian, I realized that I was wrestling not with flesh and blood anymore. But now I was wrestling against the unseen world, the principalities and rules of the air of darkness. And so I had to learn to fight in a different way, not flesh against flesh, but I had to learn to hear the voice of my Heavenly Father and to wrestle in the spiritual realm so I could walk in the victories of the Lord and be the champion God called me to be. You know, I find that there's a lot of leaders, a lot of individuals that have a difficulty. They start the race, but they don't know how to finish the race. What I want to do is I want to go in a moment to a, a video that we did in, in preparation for our Leadership Awakening DVD series that we've been put out. And that series really is a 12 DVD program that really is able to encourage people how to not just run the race, but to finish the race and to finish the race well. It's important for us to get these principles and fundamentals of our faith to know how we can be all that God wants us to be. God didn't call you to fail. He called you to be a champion. We may struggle at times, but we pick up and we look to the Lord and He leads us to that place of victory. So I want to go to this video here in a moment on the introduction to our Leadership Awakening DVD series. And I pray that it will be an encouragement to you. And afterwards, I want to explain a little bit about how we can run this race in such a way to finish well. You see, God didn't call you to start the race. He called you to finish the race. Hi, welcome to Leadership Awakening, running the race to finish well. I'm Doug Stringer. You know, we live in a world of difficulties and challenges, and there's a vacuum and a void of persevering, courageous, and transformational leadership. We need those kinds of leaders in this world, especially with the attributes and characteristics of the kingdom of God, if we're going to impact the cultures of our time. You know, I was thinking about a story about John Stevens Macquarie, who was from Tanzania considered one of the best marathon runners in the world. And during the 1968 Olympics that was held in Mexico City, he came, but wasn't accustomed to the altitude there in Mexico City. During the race, 75 people started the race, and about the halfway mark, there was a collision. He was injured, he hurt his knee and his shoulder, but continued with bandages and with pain, limping and jogging and walking to finish the race. Out of the 75 that started the race, 57 finished, he was number 57. And when he finished and crossed the, the finish line, they said, why would you do this being injured and in such pain? And he said, my nation did not send me thousands of kilometers to start a race, but to finish the race. See, God didn't call us to start this race, but to finish the race. I was thinking about, in fact, talking about touching the cultures of our times. Lou Gertzner, the former CEO of IBM, when IBM was in a great challenge and needed to change the culture of that company to succeed, said these words at a Harvard Business School. He said, transformation of an enterprise begins with a sense of crisis or urgency. 
No institution will go through fundamental change unless it believes it is in deep trouble and needs to do something different to survive. He was talking about IBM, but really we as leaders around the world, if we're going to see transformational change in the cultures of our times, we must recognize the times in which we live, like the sons of Issachar. If you look at the world today, and Hebrews 12 talks about this, that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Every institution has been shaken, from sacred to secular, everything that can be shaken, the things we've leaned on, is being shaken. The second thing is we see in Romans 8 that even the earth itself would groan with birth pangs. We've seen such an acceleration and increase of natural disasters, earthquakes, tornadoes, fires, tsunamis. There's such an escalation of these things. And the third thing is that we recognize in Psalms 2 that even there is political unrest or the nations are raging. So everything that can be shaken is being shaken. The earth itself is groaning with birth pangs, and there is political unrest, and the nations are raging. Like never before, we need persevering, courageous, and transformational leadership to rise up for the times. You know, Dr. Robert Clinton from Fuller Theological Seminary said that 70% of Christian leaders do not finish the race well. Why? I believe one of the things is that we who have a vision of purpose to lead the people to a place of promise or destination, if we become discouraged and disappointed and disillusioned in our journey, then how can we lead people to the place of their promise? We become distracted from our own destination. We need to keep a vision of hope, keep our passion for God and a compassion for hurting people like never before. You know, as Robert Clinton said that there are 70% of Christian leaders that don't finish the race well, what are then the characteristics and the attributes of the 30% that do? And we're going to be discussing some of these things, the, the kind of leader God can use, the, the hindrances to personal and corporate revival, the seven oppositions that will come against a Christian leader or a leader when they have a vision to do something, to accomplish something great, and to lead people to their victory. You know, I was thinking about this quote also by Joe McKeever, because one key issue of the 30% that do finish well is that they need to understand we need one another. We can't do this alone. In fact, Joe McKeever says, the four-year-old who says, I can do it myself, has a lot of co in common with the typical leader or pastor. Pastors, he says, are notorious for their lone ranger approach to ministry. It's what I call the number one failure of 90% of pastors. They prefer to go it alone. You know, I have a friend that is a pastor in Houston, Texas, and he used to grow up with blue healer dogs. What is a blue healer dog? A blue healer dog lives, eats, and breathes to do one thing. They want to round up the sheep, round up the cattle. But one day they had a neighbor that had 500 head of cattle but didn't have enough blue healer dogs to round them up. So the neighbors got together and said, hey, why don't we get all of our dogs and we'll bring our dogs together, have some coffee and have some fellowship time. We'll help our neighbor. Neighbors helping neighbors. When they went out that morning and it was time to get the blue healers to do what they live, breathe, and eat to do, they opened the cages and said, go blue, go blue. But these blue healers, which they love to do is for Roundup, to live, eat, and breathe to do it, would not run to round up the cattle until... They were done looking at each other. They ran to each other, growling, sniffing, and checking each other out. And no matter how much their owners said, go blue, go blue, they wouldn't even listen to the voice of their owners or their master until they were done sniffing, growling, and checking. And then they went out and got the cattle and brought them in. And the moral of that story is that there's a lot of work to be done. And we can't do this alone. We need to collaborate or die, as Wall Street Journal once said. We need to be able to come together, get past our barriers, and start to come together for a cause greater than ourselves as leaders. We need one another. I encourage pastors everywhere I go. When I ask them, how many are you pastoring in your city? And they'll say 50, 5,000, 20,000, 14,000. And I said, well, how, what's the population of your region? Houston, Texas, for example, is Four and a half to six million people. It depends on how much you include the suburbs and the surrounding areas. Or what's the population of Oklahoma or City? Or what's the population of, of Singapore? What's the population of, of Brisbane, Australia? When we begin to get a concept that we're not just pastoring a congregation, but that we're called to co-pastor a region together, all of a sudden it gets us out of our own personal kingdom building into a greater vision to stretch our vision to encompass the whole community and impacting every element of the culture. 
Speaking of that, the cultures, you know, uh, Lauren Cunningham, the founder of YWAM, and the late Dr. Bill Bright of Campus Crusade, uh, and now, of course, Lance Walnow and many others are talking about what's called the seven mountains or the spheres of, of the culture, how to impact them. In fact, we look here, and um, it says that, that there is business, government, media, arts and entertainment, education, family, and religion. These are commonly known as the seven mountains or the seven spheres of the culture. And we're called to impact all of it, not just our sacred congregations, but how do we get empower our people within the congregations to envelop and encompass a whole community by which we then reach the whole culture. To do that, we've got to do that together, and we can't do that alone. See, it's part of a net. If I use a fishing pole, I can catch one fish. But if I want to catch a lot of fish, we have to become a mended net together. So God is always calling us to be a mended net, to become part of a cause greater than ourselves, rather than being a fishing pole and catching one fish at a time. Here's another quote by uh, Robert uh, McShane, who was a, a, a communicator and preacher of 1813 to 1843. He said, there is nothing more deceitful than your estimate of your own strength. Remember, you are not a tree that can stand alone. You're only a branch, and it's only while you abide in Him as a branch that you will flourish. And this is true for each and every one of us. It's important if we're going to be persevering, courageous, and transformational leaders that we must understand that we cannot go this alone. We need one another. And we also have to understand that to keep our vision of hope and the place of destination, we have to look past our immediate circumstances that seem to bring discouragement along the way. How do we get past those? How do we get past the mountains, the valleys, the giants in the way? Well, there's many things that we need to learn from that, the attributes and the characteristics of the kingdom of God. And I believe these, these next few lessons in persevering leadership and courageous and transformational leadership, part of our Leadership Awakening series, will help you to get your focus on a kingdom value, the kingdom characteristics. This is my spiritual father, one of my spiritual fathers, the late Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole, who founded the Christian Men's Network around the world, said, the characteristics of the kingdom emanate from the, char- the characteristics of the king. The characteristics of the kingdom emanate from the character of the king. That's King Jesus. If we understand Christ's likeness and we understand Christ's purposes for us, in us, and through us to impact the culture of our day, then we'll make a lasting, long-term transformational impact, not just touch our communities, but we will bring reformation and transformation that will impact every element of the culture, all the seven spheres or the seven mountains of our culture. It's important for us as leaders to have a kingdom vision. While men reach for thrones to build their own kingdoms, Jesus reached for a towel to wash men's feet. How do we serve our culture? How do we serve our generation? And how do we leave a lasting impact for the characteristics of the kingdom of God? To think that 70% of Christian leaders According to Dr. Robert Clinton of Fuller Theological Seminary, 70% of Christian leaders do not finish the race well. Wow. It's important for us to find out what it is for the 30% that do finish well. How do they run well and finish well? I shared the story as you saw in the, in the cutaway there in our Leadership Awakening DVD series. You saw in there where I tell the story of John Stevens Aquari from Tanzania. And during the Olympics in uh, Mexico City, he wasn't accustomed to the altitude. And to think that out of 75 people that started that race during those Olymp- that Olympics and that marathon, that only 57 finished. He was number 57. I don't remember who started the race. I don't remember who won the race. I only know one person out of the 75 people that I can recall in my mind, I can only remember one name. And he didn't come in number one, two, or three. Didn't get a gold medal. But because of the heroic act of saying, I didn't come all these thousands of miles or kilometers. My country did not send me these thousands of miles or kilometers to start a race, but to finish the race. Talk about an act of courage. What a great testament to all of us as believers that it's important that Jesus didn't give His life for us, didn't die on the cross for us and say, it is finished for us so that we could start a race and not finish. 
He wants us to run well and finish well. I love this scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. It says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to also to all who have loved His appearing. I have this expectation and anticipation of the coming of the Lord. I, I want to walk in awe of God every day, realizing, look what He has done for me. Not because of what He's going to do for me, but just because, because, because of what He's already done for me. That while I was still yet in my sin, Jesus gave His life for me. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oftentimes in our walk with the Lord, we can forget. We can forget that He is the one that's cheering us on. He is the one that has already paid the price by His outpouring of love and grace and mercy and long suffering for us. That He's paid the price that we might live and live that life more abundantly. We forget sometimes it's not the works of our own ability, our own capacity, our intellectual ability or capacity, but it's because of the grace of God that while we were still down and out, we were still in our, the darkest place of our lives and the, the darkness of the sea of sin, Jesus embraced us and called us to Himself. And as we surrender to Him in our mind, in our hearts, in our bodies, to give, himself, give ourselves completely to Him, then we can hear His voice clearly in all the muck and the mire of, of the world around us, in all the distractions and potential disappointments that God is still there calling our name. Just like my friend who was speaking to his son and his son said to him, Dad, you don't get it, do you? Of all the thousands of voices and people cheering, we go across that finish line, all I hear is your voice. Oh, that I would only hear the voice of the Heavenly Father today. That you would learn to hear and discern the voice of the Father. To be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because God's desire for you is a good and not of evil, of hope in a future and not of evil and despair. Yes, we go through natural things in our lives, difficulties in our lives, but God doesn't leave us there. He brings us always to a place beyond the moment. That's the theme of our TV show, Life Beyond the Moment. Why? Because there's always life beyond the moments of challenge. See, our desire to win must be greater than our moments of difficulty, greater than our moments of challenge, greater than our moments of discouragements or disappointments. The Lord always has a way to take us to a place that's better than the place that we've been or been through. I want to take a moment to look even at some scriptures here. When I think of, of Jesus, you know, he really was, you know, we think of John uh, Stevens Aquari being, they called him the, the man who wouldn't quit. But long before him, there was our Lord and Savior who really was the man who wouldn't quit. Let me give you a, a story. I was helping a homeless person one time and picked him up from the streets and took him to church and, and gave him some new clothes. And he hadn't bathed for a couple of weeks, so I got him a bath at my apartment back in the 80s and then took him to church. And he gave his life to the Lord. And later on, I was at a, an, an outreach, a crusade that was happening in Houston. And I was way up in the nosebleed section as one of the kind of the counselors and helping usher people. And, and I, someone came to me and says, there's a group of homeless men that are looking for you. And I said, really, what do they say? They said, we want to find Doug Stringer. He says, well, we don't know exactly what sections he's in. Can we help you? And he said, no, I've got to find Doug Stringer. They said, why do you have to find Doug Stringer? And he said, because Doug became a man for me. I want to be a man for Him. Boy, that just resonated in my heart. Because of Christ in me and God's love in me to reach out to this homeless man to help him, he saw a tangible expression of Christ's love and he came and said, I've got to find Doug Stringer because he became a man for me. I want to be a man for him. And when I thought about that, I thought about this. And I think about this very often. The lesson I learned from a homeless man, Jesus, every day, I want to be a man for you because you became a man for me. If I think about where I would be today if it wasn't for the Lord, I have no clue where I'd be. I, I may not even be here today, but by the grace of God, God called my name, God called your name. And no matter what we go through, God is pulling us to Himself. And if we could just remember in the midst of our greatest despairs, the greatest difficulties, the greatest challenges, that Jesus became a man for us, God came in the flesh. 
to reconcile us because we have been separated from God. Jesus came that we might be reconciled to our Creator, the God of the heavens of the heavens, the God that the heavens of the heavens can't even contain. Jesus gave Himself for us. He became a man that we might be able to find life and life more abundantly. Jesus, God Himself came, gave Himself for us. So every day I want to be a man for Jesus because He became a man for me. We see in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it was time to be crucified. Jesus literally, steadfastly was determined to set His face to get to Jerusalem. Why? Because to get to Jerusalem meant to be shamed and crucified and abused. But it says He steadfastly was determined to get there. Why would He be so determined to be beaten, crucified, shamed, to get up on the cross, brutalized? Why? Because He saw beyond the cross. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3 says that we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before Him. What joy? What kind of joy can you get to go to the cross? His joy was the ability to look past His moment of sacrifice and pain and look past to see you today, to see me, to see all those that are watching today. Maybe you don't really have that place of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I want you to pray with me in a moment. And that prayer is simply this, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, would you reveal yourself to me? Our God, the God who loves us so much, gave himself for us, is not one we have to find our way to him. We call upon him and he finds us. He comes to us. He poured out his life for us. We can't win or attain or gain his favor. We simply humble ourselves before him and say, God, I need you. Jesus, if you are who you say you are, reveal yourself to me. And then we see scripture after scripture where it says in Luke chapter 12, verse 50, he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. In other words, the New English Version says, until it is finished. The man who finished well was Jesus. The one who wouldn't quit is Jesus. He says, until it is finished, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is finished. He was determined to go to the cross for you and me. In John chapter 19, verse 30, it says, Jesus said on the cross, when it was all said and done, he said, it is finished. It is complete. He may have been one who had to stumble through in the pain of the flesh and the natural realm, but he was determined to finish his race. Why? To finish his race for you and me. He didn't quit. He finished. He became a man for us. He gave himself for us. He finished the race for us that we may live. Jesus didn't come from heaven to earth not to finish. That's why I want to be a man for Jesus because he became a man for me. I encourage you today, would you pray that prayer I talked about? Jesus, if you are who you say you are, reveal yourself to me. And Jesus will. He did for me over 30 years ago. And I've seen hundreds of thousands of people around the world say that same prayer. I've seen multitudes come to know the Lord Jesus Christ because I simply said yes to God and made myself available to God. You can do the same thing. Go in peace and may the Lord Jesus Christ grant you the desires of your heart today. Remember, with God, there is life beyond each moment of challenge or pain in your life.